God of grace and glory, pour out the power of your Holy Spirit on our worship and our gathering. Strengthen and protect us with your steadfast faithfulness. Feed us with the bread of life and guide our steps with the wisdom of your word. In your holy name we pray, amen. Let us quiet ourselves for worship. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome, friends. Let us join our hearts finding God's peace together in worship. Good morning. Just a few announcements this morning. I uh, want to call your attention, if you haven't seen it, to the uh, informational sheet that's in the, that's in the bulletin today. This is a... Uh, is an explanation of the seal for the Presbyterian Church, which is this, effectively the logo. The logo has a number of uh, symbols in it, and this has been included in the bulletin today for everybody to review. There's quite a bit of uh, symbolism in our, our logo for the church. Also, this Wednesday at 5.30 is Room at the Table here uh, in the basement. We have uh, continued to have fellowship time at 10.30 each Sunday here at the church. The, uh, I am told this morning that uh, Bible school will start in two weeks. Is that right? Uh, for, the, for the kids. And we have con a continuing need for lay leaders and greeters. You can sign up in the back and the whiteboard. Uh, there's a marker. It's easy. Um, if, you're, if you just pick up the marker, write your name in there, put on the date, uh, then we'll, we'll make sure that, uh, that you get the paperwork to stand here so you don't have to listen to me. Uh, Today is our sense and sense, uh, our sensibility uh, offering, and that will be collected at the end of worship. And upcoming, we have the women of the church uh, gathering for the Bible study for 24 and 25. This will be 
The first meeting will be on Wednesday, September 18th at 10 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, study books will be available for uh, the Women's Bible Study, which begins at the first meeting on the 18th. The cost is $10 uh, per book. Uh, please see Carol Hornbuckle after the worship. And the study group will continue to meet every third Wednesday of the month through the end of uh, May, so May of 2025. And we will be resuming our monthly potluck dinners at church, uh, after church services on September 8th. Again, if anybody is in the hospital is in need of visits, um, either yourself or friends or family, please call the church and let us know. Please join me in the responsive call to worship. God is our sun and our shield. Glory is upon us. God is our strength and our hope. God's faithfulness guides us. God is our hope and our salvation. God's love and mercy welcome us. Our hymn of praise today is Softly and Tenderly, number 418 in the glory to God. Let us confess our sins to the one whose eyes are open day and night to heed our cry and our prayer. Please join me in the unison prayer of confession. Glorious God of spirit and life, we long to look upon your face and live. We yearn to shine with your glory despite our tarnished lives. We seek to stand firm and faithful, even when the storms of life threaten us. Lift us up with your mercy, that we may perceive your loving grace. Light our paths with your wisdom, and strengthen us 
with your powerful spirit, that we may follow you faithfully all the days of our lives. Please join me in the responsive assurance of God's grace. God is our sun and our shield. Christ is the bread of our life. The Spirit is our strength and our power. In these truths, we are clothed with protection to live with justice, truth, and peace. We are blessed to have Susan Lawrenson with us this morning to share the gospel. So, I tend to be one of the people, one of these people that um, can get really caught up in like a TV show. Um, Like I will, I will get invested in these people, right? Um, I like movies too, but I feel like I don't have a lot of time with the characters in the movies to really invest as much. Um, But TV shows, man, and some of them are crazy. Like, I really, I really like ones that kind of throw a curveball in there every now and then, because I don't like them predictable, because for some reason, my mind's trying to figure everything out, and if it's predictable and I already know, I'm like, oh, I'm on board. Um, so <clears throat> that's probably part of my ADD, but um, it is what it is. Um, but I can get really really invested in a show to the point where I think about it. I think about how is that going to turn out? You know, if, if a character I love dies, I will grieve. That sounds so weird, doesn't it? It's like I'm just watching a fictional thing, but I can get just transported completely away from where I'm at into that world, right? And I freak sometimes, because if I'm left on a cliffhanger, if you do any Netflix, the whole thing will come out, and then you'll binge it, and then you have to wait another year or something for it to come out, and you're just like, how am I going to think about this for a year? But I do. Um, It's almost like it just takes me out of where I am. Um, And I think I get... You know, like I said, concerned because I don't know how it's going to turn out. Like, I know how I want it to turn out, but I don't know if it's going to turn out that way, right? I don't know if you can relate to this, but sometimes I feel like I'm watching my own life like it's a TV show. Sometimes I'll just be like, and sometimes I just sit back because it's like, I got nothing I can do. I'm just going to watch, you know, get some popcorn. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't be involved in our lives. Obviously we are. But I think it can be easy for us to just sit back and look at our lives and watch it all unfold. And then when things don't happen the way we want them to happen, we can get really upset. We can grieve. Um, And I do that with TV shows because I don't know how it ends. But as a believer, I know ultimately, in the end, Jesus wins. And if Jesus wins, I win. Right? I mean, that's one of the most assurance, one of the most blessed assurances that we have that in the end it's all going to be okay. But I can still get caught up in thinking it's not. God said it is not possible for anyone to truly rest until they are aware that all things are happening according to a divine plan. But when life gets really hard, 
tragedies happen. <clears throat> Unthinkable things happen. I don't know about you, but I don't feel at rest. We know, and we've been told in Scripture, life is not going to be easy. We are going to have troubles in this life. Okay, And I'm, I'm sure that everyone in here has not gone unscathed. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. So what do we do when we keep getting punched and knocked down and thrown around um, by the trials of this life? What do we do? How do, how do, we, how do we deal with that? The scripture I have today, I've chosen three verses, but as I was preparing, I realized you don't want to be here till noon, and I don't want to keep you here until, oh wait, that was for last. I don't want to keep you here till one, because there's just a lot going on here, um, and I'm only going to be able to get through that first verse today. Um, so, here we go. We're going to be in Romans 8. Um, the verse we're going to focus on, the one verse that we're going to focus on, is Romans 8, 28. If you have been churched in any way, you probably know this verse by heart. And we know the co- that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love the Lord. To, to those who are called according to his purpose. Now, I'm an English person, and I realized that sentence starts with a conjunction. And, very few sentences will start with and. And what that means is, it's connected to the part prior. And the part prior is talking about going through struggles and um, crying out, not knowing how to pray, and how the Spirit can intercede for us. Um, It uses the term groanings of our spirit. You ever had groanings of your spirit? I can recall a couple of mine. Were you just so lost in what to do that you're paralyzed to do anything? That's when the Holy Spirit can come and help us in that. Um, But there's other parts in this we're going to break down. Um, First of all, when he says all things, does sin include all things? I mean, he said all things. And the answer is it could be. See, we look at this and we, we can see, and we've probably experienced how someone has hurt us or a situation has hurt us. And we see how God has maybe used that for the good of you. When it's somebody else that has done the offense and you are innocent or someone else is innocent and you see that, it's a lot easier for us to look at that situation and say, absolutely, God used it for the good. Because they're innocent. They're not the ones that caused it. Marilyn Meberg um, was a speaker at Women of Faith years ago. And I remember being at a Women of Faith conference and she told a story about her daughter, with her daughter's permission. Um, Her daughter had just graduated college, I believe, and was working a part-time job while going to college. And 
Just to set the stage, this was <clears throat> not long after 9-11. And a gentleman from her work asked her out to go out on a date. And she wanted to go. Um, but he was of Arab descent. And so she went home and talked to her parents about it. She said, I don't want to not give him the benefit of the doubt. Because how, you know, if you remember, you remember the culture and the climate of our country at that time toward any people who were of Arab descent. <clears throat> and her parents, her mom and her dad, were said, you know, if, if, you, if you want to go on a date with him, go on a date with him. So they did. Um, went on a date. He went to take her home. And he raped her. And Marilyn talks about the guilt she felt, even though she knows in her mind it wasn't her fault, but in some way she was giving permission for that to happen. She talks about her daughter and how it crushed her. And then she talks about years later. Her daughter is now, or was at that time, uh, a therapist for women um, who had been abused. And she said, I know that it's hard to look at when you see something that horrific happen and think God is in it in some way, but he is. He's not causing it, but he's in it with you. And he will use it for good in his divine plan. And that's hard to hear for people who have been horribly hurt. It would be hard to hear as a parent if your child has been abused. You don't want to hear that there's a divine plan with this involved. You want to hear that it's going to make it better. And ultimately, God will. And there's always reasons. We don't know why. Sometimes we do. Sometimes we find out why. Sometimes we don't. And we won't know on this side of eternity. But I believe we will someday, of how all of this works together for the good of those who love the Lord. <clears throat> it's easy to look at the innocent. It's a little harder to look at the guilty. The people who are the ones doing the offending. Could that work for their good as well? It could. I think the story of uh, Joseph, Jacob's son Joseph, Joseph, the boy of, with the coat of many colors, I think that's a good example. Um, real quick summary. Joseph was the most loved son. His dad did not make that hidden. Um, and the brothers, the older brothers, were uh, very jealous. So they went out one day, took him out, and uh, sold him into slavery. And then came back and told his dad that uh, an animal had come and killed him. Uh, crushed the father. Brothers were like, shwoo, got rid of that golden child. Joseph went into Egypt, where God allowed everything that he did to succeed. <clears throat> so he ended up in the right place where God had intended him to be. Ultimately, through even sin of his master's wife trying to get him to lay with her and refusing, and then she saying he did, um, and being in prison for years. 
He ended up being the second in command in Egypt. Only person above him was Pharaoh. God put him there for a specific purpose. If your family sells you into slavery, at least for me, my first thought's not going to be, God, I can't wait how you make this work out. I'm not going to understand. Joseph didn't understand. But he knew that his God was God. He knew that whatever the situation, God was going to get him through it. So years come, there's a famine, his family comes. He, real, he, he recognizes his brothers. His brothers do not recognize him. And why would you? Talking to the person who runs the land of Egypt, not expecting to see your brother. Joseph, or I mean, is it Joseph? Yes, Joseph. I get mixed up. Joseph um, said, I'm your brother. <clears throat> um, and don't worry, do not fear, I'm not going to hurt you. Um, I'm here for a reason. His father comes. Happy reunion. Then his father dies. And the brothers are like, ew. Now Jacob, or now Joseph could really like waylay us because dad's dead. And he doesn't have to maybe look to dad and explain himself. So this is what, this is, this is Joseph's response. Um, the brothers come to him and uh, throw themselves at his feet and just ask for mercy, and he says, do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? As for you, you meant what you did for evil, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people's lives. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will take care of you and your little ones. Obviously, what had happened to, jo happened to Joseph, God used for good. But what the brothers did, it also worked for good for them. They were the ones who were also kept alive. It's kind of hard to reconcile sometimes. I need to be clear about something. <clears throat> when God says all things work for the good, he doesn't mean all things for all people. He's talking to believers here. He's saying all things work for the good of those who love the Lord. And unfortunately, there are going to be people who it does not work for the good of them. And it will not end up good for them. And that's very sad. However, That does not give us a place to be judging. We may know that there are people that don't know Jesus. We may know there are people who blatantly don't want anything to do with Jesus. And it doesn't mean that what they're doing now will have no impact on them later. Because it doesn't say, all things work for the good of those who love the Lord at this moment. And I have to remember that because I have so many loved ones. I have so many 
students that I now do not know Jesus on a personal level. And obviously, they're making mistake after mistake. What I like to say is, they are living out their testimony that someday they will be able to give. Because I, I believe that all of them can be saved. So we're really not in a position to be judging whether that or this or that action or whatever is going to work for the good. We're not there to be we're not, we're not there to do that. We're just there to support it. And I don't mean sin. I don't mean support sin. And it doesn't also mean that he's saying, okay, you're a Christian. You have a ticket to sin because it's going to work out in the end. Don't worry about it. Um, that is not what he's saying either. The hardest part, though, for me that I can say um, is I know God has a divine plan. I know I'm part of that plan. I'm willing to play whatever role I, you know, I'm willing to do that. And when it comes to me, I'm like, bring it. Like, I had cancer, breast cancer six years ago. I'm good now. Just found out last spring I had melanoma. I'm good so far. I mean, I'm not hoping for the trifecta, but, you know, who knows? I'm good, though. I'm like, you, I, I'll be a megaphone. Because really, I know this life is temporary. But when stuff starts happening to my kids, or people I love, it's a lot harder to stick with that divine plan. About two and a half years ago, <clears throat> I was on a preaching circuit, a full time. I was doing it almost every weekend. And I chose to step down. Um, because my, uh, my heart was not where it needed to be. See, <clears throat> my daughter had just been in a relationship, three year relationship, <clears throat> that I. I was hoping wouldn't go anywhere, and it didn't. Um, she was in college. She was working full time. Um, she was just getting her feet under her so that she could go out in the world, right? Um, and she was dating people here and there, and but nothing like serious, you know. I mean, and then and then she started dating this one guy, who uh, I taught, by the way. Um, he was one of my former students. Nice enough kid. Um, I would have never seen them together. Um, but I'm like, okay, you know, just be careful, whatever. Um, and then she told me, sorry. And then she told me that, Mom, he's like telling me he loves me and stuff. She's like, I am not there. I'm like, okay, well, you don't have to go along with anything, you know. So after maybe a week or two, they, they broke up. She's like, I, we're just different people. I'm like, okay. And inside I was like, shwew, dodged a bullet. So then a few weeks later, ooh, sorry. A few weeks later, she uh, calls me, says, Mom, can you come over? I said, sure. So I come over. And she says, um, I'm pregnant. And I'm pretty sure I just wanted to shock because she told me and she started crying. And I just said, oh, honey. And I hugged her. And she just told me that, you know, it's Mike's, the one that I was with this last time, you know, the, the guy that I used, I was dating a little bit, the one I taught. And uh, 
they had already broken up. They weren't even together. And I was, I was numb. Because uh, I couldn't understand how God would make that plan, the divine plan. I didn't want that to be the divine plan. So uh, I tried to hijack it a little bit, a little bit. I did not see a good outcome from this. Um, They aren't together. She doesn't want to be with him. Anyway, nine months later, my grandson Jackson was born. And I'm telling you, I, I didn't pray for anything specifically to happen to that pregnancy. But I didn't pray for it not, not to. And that little boy lights up my life like you would never believe. I can't imagine my life without him. This child that I never wanted to come to fruition is one of the most beautiful children I have ever seen. And I love him dearly. And my daughter, my daughter, it's like she was born to be a mother. She's a much better mom than I am. I mean, I will tell her that time and time again. She's very, very patient. She learned, you know, just because your kids are upset doesn't mean you have to get upset. And I'm a Gen Xer. It's like, you don't, you want to keep crying? I'm going to give you something to cry about. You know. But that's not how she is. She's an amazing mom. And then about a year after Jackson was born, she tells me, Mom, I'm starting to have feelings for Mike. Because <clears throat> Mike's been coming over now, spending time with Jackson. He's not a baby person. He doesn't know what to do with the baby. He's very open about that. He's like, I will do what I can, but I don't know what to do. So the first year of Jackson's life, Sid was the primary. And he'd come over and see him. But after about a year, he was more and more present. And she said, I'm starting to have feelings for him. I said, well, okay. I think you have to judge those feelings. I said, but you know what, ultimately? Ultimately, Jackson's going to have a better upbringing with a mom and dad who are present and together. And who and to love him regardless. So, they are together. They will be getting married at some point. I have none of them are married. None of the parents are married. I'm hoping for one. But, it, and they will. But Mike has assured me I'm going to marry your daughter. And I said, I have no doubt, Mike. They also have another one, Carter. He's five months old. And he is also another light of my life. I live with them. So I get to see him all the time. And I'm Gaga, um, which I love. But if I would have had things my way, I would have changed that divine plan. 
If I had the ability to do it, I would have done it in a heartbeat, no questions asked. And I would have missed out on two beautiful, beautiful children and lives and being a gaga to them. Sometimes it doesn't make sense what happens. Sometimes we can't wrap our minds around why it's happening or how this is even going to turn out for good. But we have to live in the knowledge that God says all things work for the good of those who love the Lord and those who are called according to his purpose. And if that's you, that's your plan. Sometimes we just have to get out of the way of ourselves. I tumble rocks. I don't think I shared that with you last time, did I? Okay. Um, you all have a rock, and if you don't... Sorry. If you don't have a rock, um, I will get you one before you leave. Um, but Lorelai was nice enough to take those around and have everybody choose a rock. Um, I started tumbling rocks a couple years ago because um, I was kind of that nerdy kid on vacation. We was like, I'm going to go look for rocks. Um, but specifically tumbled rocks, polished rocks, I just think they're beautiful. And when I was younger... When I was younger, I kept asking for and asking for and asking for a rock tumbler. And if any of you know anything about a rock tumbler, um, it has to be going 24-7 for a month at least. Um, and they're loud. <clears throat> and I'm pretty sure... Um, Mine disappeared, and I'm pretty sure I know why, because my dad was a police officer, and he worked different shifts all the time, and I'm pretty sure that accidentally on purpose got thrown away because it was loud and it was not allowing him to sleep. But then my brother, who's five years younger, claims, I just found this out like two weeks ago, he claims he got a rock tumbler for his birthday, and I'm like, did they re-gift that to you? He goes, I remember the rock tumbler. I'm like... I had the rock tumbler, so we had a little argument. Anyway, I digress. I tumble rocks, and I love them. And uh, my daughter, like I said, you know, I live with her, and uh, <clears throat> I just went all out when I started this. I'm like, ooh. So I bought a bunch of rocks, because you can't find all of the ones you really want to tumble around here. So I, I bought a bunch of them. Uh, in case any of you need to know, um, if you're buying rock, rough rock, you need to make sure that you hit the tumble rough rock, or they're going to send you huge slabs of rock that you're going to have to then turn around and buy more equipment to break on your own, and it's hard. So um, I just got these rocks, and I just started tumbling them, and tumbling them, and tumbling them, and I was just loving it, and they're beautiful. And Sid's so like, Mom, um, <clears throat> what are you going to do with these rocks? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. Why? She goes, well, are you going to sell them or what? And I said, no. She's like, well, I don't, like, what is the purpose? I don't know. And I'm like, well, Sid, um, joy, happiness. It makes me happy to do it. And she's like, well, that's fine, Mom, but you're accumulating a lot of rocks. And I'm like, well, just bury me with them when I die, if there's going to be a problem, you know. But then last year, I realized, oh, she's right. <laughs> I do have a lot of rocks. Um, and while I love them, I'm not going to, like, it's like I had to 
come to terms with the fact, I'm not going to sit around, you know, like, you know, Lord of the Rings and be like, mmm, precious, with all my, you know, rocks. What's the point in that? So I decided I need to give them away. Um, so last year, it was the first year, I decided to give rocks away to my seniors. Any of the kids that I've had in class, <clears throat> if they're a senior, um, I will pick a rock specifically for them. I will tell them why I've chosen that rock for them. And then I will give them the spiel. And this is the spiel. I'm giving you this rock because life is really, really, really hard. Sometimes you're going to have to deal with circumstances that you did not create. And you are the complete victim here. And sometimes you're going to have consequences of choices you made. Still not easier. But I need you to understand something. And I want you to all look at your rocks. <clears throat> The rocks you have in your hand did not start out that way. They started out looking something like this. They're jagged. They're not all that pretty. They're dirty. That's what they start out with. Because they get banged around and around. It starts taking the harshness off of the edges. It starts taking the outside, which might not be very pretty, and illuminating the inside. This is what I want you to think about when life is getting hard. I want you to think about these rocks. <clears throat> and I want you to remember that the rock you have now doesn't look like it did because of those hard things. If you allow the difficult things in your life to mold you and shape you, it will bring out the beautiful in you. What I really want to say, because I work in a public school, is I really want to say, you're going to get knocked around, some of you more so than others, and you're going to think like you can't get up and do anything, and you just rather just give it up. But I need you to know. I need you to look at your rock and I need you to remember, you are not the same way you were at the beginning. And the whole purpose in God's divine plan, one of the purposes is, and it says in Scripture, He is forming you to be more like Jesus. So when I say the beauty that comes out in you, what I really want to say is I want to say the beauty of Jesus that is coming out in you is only because of these hard things. It's nice to know we have a divine plan. It's also nice to know that there are people that might feel the same way you do and I do when things get difficult. I told you at the beginning that that starts with an and. This first starts with an and. So <clears throat> what I hope you'll do is I hope you'll take your rock and I hope you'll keep it. Maybe somewhere you can see it. Maybe all the time, maybe not. Maybe you'll put it in a drawer. But if you ever get to the point where you're like, I'm having a rough time with this divine plan, why don't you look at your rock? And I want you to 
say whatever's going on. Lord, I am I'm struggling with what's going on. I'm struggling with fill in the blank. And you claim it, but then you say, and I know that all things are going to work for the good for me because I love you. And you have come according to your purpose. Now, it's not going to take the pain away. But it is going to remind us that there's someone in it with us. Our lives are not haphazard results of chance. All that comes to pass in our lives, all of it, is according to an eternal plan of the all-wise, all-knowing, all-loving Father. Will you pray with me? Father, um, you're so good, and uh, man, I don't know all the things that everyone's gone through, um, but you do. And you know that it is all working um, for the good of your divine plan. Father, help us just to remember that it is your plan. It's not ours. We can't hijack it. And if we changed it, it wouldn't be as good. Father, help us to remember that um, there is a purpose in the things of this life. And while you bring us so much joy and so much laughter and so many good things, there are also hard things. We thank you for taking those things and making us more like you. And we pray the prayer, Father, that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our next hymn is Just As I Am. It's on page 442. Thank you. 
times of uh, tithes and offerings that ushers would come forward. our unison prayer of dedication. Bread of heaven, thank you for nourishing us with your mercy and your grace. Thank you for your blessing us to be your disciples, disciples who share freely with your word. Many gifts and offerings become food and blessings for your world. Amen. Our last hymn is Seek Ye First on 175. Oh, 
Let's go.